Joining me on the channel today is Lorelai Saverin, author of Circus of Stolen Dreams, out now from Philomel. It's a middle grade novel about a girl who enters a circus built on dreams to escape the pain of her brother's disappearance. Welcome. Thank you so much for being on the channel. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I always like to kind of start your journey to become a coming a published author with a little bit about you. So what kind of kid were you growing up? I was a very well-behaved bookish child. I would read books. I hated getting in trouble. I loved school. I loved worksheets. Like I had a younger brother, so I played with him a lot, fought with him sometimes, but um, just, yeah, I was that kind of kid. I just like to bike around town and dream and imagine. I love it. And what kind of books did you like as a kid growing up? I liked books in the vein of the book I have written, <laughs> uh, which is kind of fun. I loved magical stories like oh, A Wrinkle in Time. I know that's kind of science fiction, but books that just sort of took me to another place and another time. I loved reading historical fiction. I loved books that made me feel things like Bridge to Terabithia. And I also loved being scared. I loved reading ghost stories. I would just check out ghost stories from the library and oh, read those. And then I also read a lot of Babysitter's Club. Very popular amongst the kids. Um, on Goodreads, you wrote about your book, this story is meant to feel like a hug to any kid who has ever walked a difficult road. So this sounds like a book that's really like personal to you. Yes, it definitely has some personal threads. There are a couple of specific things that I included in this novel that I hope will help kids who are maybe walking a difficult path. The first is my character and her, my main character and her brother uh, part of their sadness comes from the fact that their parents are getting a divorce. And I wanted to really accurately represent how difficult that can be for kids to get that news. I was 12 when my parents divorced and I wanted just to give an opportunity for kids to see themselves and maybe the sadness or the hard parts of that. But then on the same lines, I wanted as the story progresses for any kid who's going through that to feel hope at the end and to feel like things won't always feel so shockingly sad or deeply sad, and that family love can transcend what the family structure looks like. Because I found that I, my relationship with both of my parents today is wonderful, and I just remember how acutely sad I felt at that time, and I wanted to give that hope that, yes, this is hard to acknowledge that and just be like, yes this is so hard and that's okay that it's hard, but also that it won't forever and always be that way. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of it is I wrote this story in the wake of grief. We had lost someone really precious in our family and I found myself thinking about the suddenness of the loss and wishing that somehow I had a way to go back in time and change something about what I did in order to change the outcome for the person that passed away in our family, if I could somehow go back and save her. And I found myself just playing with that idea over and over again and wishing, gosh, I wish I could do something that could save her. And I think that a lot of kids around the age that my target audience is will experience a loss of some kind. That's the age where we kind of become aware of death and dying and grief. And so while we can't actually go back and change the outcome for someone that we've lost here. I've written a story where a character gets that magical chance. She has a chance to go back and fight to save the one that she's lost. And even being able to do that inside the pages of a story, writing it, I found healing for me. My daughter, who was also impacted by the loss, she's almost nine, she found it healing. And my one of my greatest hopes is that a, another child somewhere will find that aspect of it healing and helpful for them as well. So there's a couple of tougher subjects that my book tackles in hopefully a hopeful and healing way. Yeah, I think when you put like 
yourself into a book like that, it definitely reaches the readers in a, in a powerful way. Like I can tell this book is something that is, is important to you. It's kind of like a heart book. And in fact, you got a starred review from Booklist on your day, which is a very rare thing for a debut author to get. So what was it like finding out that your book got a starred review? I had just, you know, refreshed my email as writers do many times a day. <laughs> and I saw I had her from my editor with starred review in all caps. And it took me a little bit I was making the kids lunch or something like that. And it took me just a moment to be like, wait, what? Like I was prepared, you know, for like average reviews. I was prepared for silence. Like that really caught me off guard. And I read, had to read through the review a few times to really let it sink in. I'm somebody who maybe takes criticism fairly um, intensely and who maybe brushes off compliments too quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to really work hard on letting go of criticism and taking moments to be like, somebody said something nice about something I did and to really sit in that and let that feel good. Mm -hmm. So that was really good practice to make, to make me do that. But I also felt like the reviewer from Booklist really understood the story I was trying to tell. Like they, they got it and it was wonderful to see it articulated so eloquently and in such a beautiful, wonderful review. And uh, so what was your path from as a kid, like reading books and loving books to wanting to be an author yourself? It was always this thing in the back of my mind. I ended up meandering in college through many different potential majors. I ended up majoring in creative writing in the throes of the recession of the early 2000s. <laughs> so it wasn't really a great bet for me to make money off of. I, after I graduated college, I worked in a cubicle in corporate America for a year, and then I became a teacher. I got my master's degree in education and had a wonderful stretch of years teaching kids, and I loved teaching writing. I loved teaching reading. Writing was my favorite subject to teach, though, so that was really fun to kind of grow young writers. Yeah. And all along those years, I kept thinking, gosh, I wish I could just find a way to write a book. And I kept making excuses like, I don't have time. What if I fail? I'm too scared to do this. And then after the birth of our third child, my husband looked at me one day after I'm sure I had been saying, oh, I would really like to try to finish writing a book. And he was like, why don't you just do it? Why don't you just take some time and write your book? And I was like, oh my gosh, like, okay. And if I say I'm going to do something, I kind of do it. Like that's kind of the person I am. There was one point in time I was at some seminar in my corporate job and they like, they asked us to set a goal for the next six months. And out of the blue, I was like, I'm going to run a marathon. And I didn't exercise at all. And, but then I started training and ran a marathon. So I'm just kind of one of those people, like I say it and then I do it because I've challenged myself. I've put that out there to myself and I just kind of want to do it. Yeah. So I wrote my first manuscript. I thought it was adult. It was actually YA. I tried and failed to get into pitch wars with it. I revised it. Oh yeah, I failed to get into pitch wars too. Yes. Pitch wars failed. <laughs> I love connecting with other people who failed to get into pitch wars and then ended up getting a book deal. It just, it's so satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was really hard. It was my first big blow of rejection, but the, one of the mentors gave me some feedback and it was really helpful. And I realized I needed to work a lot harder to get better at writing. And I was going to do it with or without a mentor. And I worked and I queried and I got some requests and I didn't get any offers of representation. And then the following summer, I got the idea for The Circus of Stolen Dreams. And I had been thinking a lot about the kind of books I wanted to write. And I thought middle grade might be a better fit for me than YA. And I thought that the circus idea had something to it. So I shelved my first manuscript and considered it my learning manuscript. Like this was where I learned a lot of things, but it's not the one. And I told my husband as I was drafting it, I was like, I think this could be my debut. I think this could be it. And I applied again to pitch wars. And then the second time I did, I got a mentorship. Yeah. My second year trying, which was really intense because the first time like the list went up, I didn't see my name. And then I had to go back and I was like, Oh no. Oh my gosh, I'm there. And so I was mentored under Juliana Brandt and Lacey Little. And it was a really, really, pressure cooker set of four months. 
I learned more about writing in those four months than I could have, I think, in years on my own. They were amazing teachers. They didn't do any of the work for me. They did. That's awesome. They did teach me, though. She, they taught me how to grow my craft. So I could apply that to anything, whether or not that was the book for me, I could take what I learned and use it in other stories. And I just felt like that was the best kind of mentorship. And I ended up querying really fast and really heavily with this story. I sent 60 some queries out in like five weeks because I knew it was as good as I could get it without an agent. Yeah. I, and I was like, I don't want to wait forever and ever and ever at like, I'd rather just know, is this a go or is this a no <laughs> sooner yeah. than later? And I know there's a lot of different strategies to querying and that's not always the best strategy, but I was pretty confident it was, it was as good as I could make it. And then I ended up signing with Chloe Steger and she's at Madeline Milburn. And then we like a month after I signed with her went on sub. That's awesome. Wow. And so so how long was the whole journey from like, I want to be a writer to, I'm going to write a book to like getting your book deal. I it was, so to anyone looking at me and my social media presence or my journey online, it probably seems pretty short because I wrote my first manuscript in the early part of 2017 and then shelved it in the summer of 2018 after working on it for over a year. And then I wrote my second story in summer of 2018 and then got an agent, sold my book in spring of 2019. So it looks like it's been a little over three years, but what that story doesn't tell is it doesn't tell the story of the 10 years that I spent wishing I had the courage to try to write a full book. Mm -hmm. And those need to be counted, I think, because yeah. that was 10 years of me writing and talking about writing a book someday. Yeah. And I was too scared to do it. So that's and also the, te the experience teaching young writers probably like really helped your craft and in, in in like more of a you know not a you actually working on your own manuscript but like getting your brain prepared for that yeah like how does writing work and making a child who was a reluctant writer grow into a passionate writer by the end of the school year was sort of a personal challenge for me and anytime I could get a kid to take that journey felt so powerful and it just reinforced to me like the power of words to change people and to help people heal. A lot of my kids were living, or my students were living in challenging situations in their own personal lives. And they found, when they found their voice and that they had stories to tell, like that was such a powerful moment. And part of, that's part of what I'm excited about being an author is hopefully being able to do some virtual school visits and in person in the future and talk to students about writing as a writer now, because it's kind of feels like merging my love of teaching and my love of writing all into one thing. And I just feel like that's going to be delightful. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. So, um, so tell us about your book. Give us the pitch. What's it about? Yes. So Andrea is grieving and feeling a lot of pain over her brother's disappearance. She chooses to deal with that pain by running away from it and escaping it and avoiding it in any way that she can. So when she finds a flyer for a circus built of dreams in the woods behind her house, she thinks that that would be the perfect escape to run away and lose herself inside these immersive dream tents where she can fly like a bird with wings, or she can hunt for treasure with pirates, or she can watch stars as they're born, or even she can go into a nightmare and have a fun scare. And she thinks that's going to be great. And it works for a while. But then when she walks into the recurring nightmare that her brother used to have before he disappeared, she realizes that if her brother's nightmare is in the stream circus, that he has to have been there as well, because the only way you get into the circus is by giving up a dream or a memory of your own to add to the tents. Mm -hmm. And so then she starts to realize that maybe the circus isn't as much of an escape as she thought it was, but that maybe it's more of a trap and that maybe her brother's still there and maybe she still has a chance to find him and save him and bring him home. Tell us about the day you found out your book was gonna be published. I was in the middle of a very challenging pregnancy. I had been nauseous the entire time, actually partway through Pitch Wars, like all the way until 
the end of revisions for my, my like developmental edits for my review, I was nauseous the entire nine months. So a lot of the good news happened with me feeling really physically unwell. Wow. And kids were playing outside and I, again, as we writers do, refreshed my email <laughs> for the bajillionth time. I knew we had gone on sub on Thursday and this was like Tuesday. It had only been, you know, a few days, but I had an email from my agent. I knew my agent was talking to an editor, uh, Liza Kaplan, and we didn't know for sure what the contents of that phone call would be, but then Chloe emailed me and it said offer and I opened it up and I saw details of an offer in the email and my kids are just playing around on the driveway and I'm just like pregnant and not feeling well but I remember staring at that screen and just looking at that and being like oh my goodness my dream is coming true this is happening this is real it's still very difficult to wrap my head around like that yeah. how like how do you cross that so badly <laughs> And, and that short amount of sub time is extremely rare. You went on sub on Thursday and you got an offer on Tuesday. I think that's only yeah. happened to one other person I know of. <laughs> yeah, it's very rare. And I, oh yeah, I try to always preface like, or talk about that because it's, I have many, many friends who have been on sub for months and they get a great deal or longer than that. And they end up with a great deal or go on sub with multiple books and then they get a deal. Like, this was very, very rare. Um, it was a preempt, so we had to decide fairly quickly about it. We had to, um, until Wednesday, about midday, to make a decision. And we just felt like that imprint and working with Liza would be such a good fit for my book. She wrote a beautiful letter about my story and how much she loved it. And I feel like it's been one of the most wonderful decisions that I've made. She understands me as a writer. She understands what I'm trying to do with these stories. Her feedback makes my stories better. And it's just something I'm thankful for every single day. And uh, what's a misconception that you had about publishing prior to becoming a published author that has now changed? I think I thought that when I got the book deal that I would just feel happy and delighted and just please this could be all of the time and I wasn't well I wasn't ready for a couple things I wasn't really prepared for the fact that I am known to move the target on myself like I can accomplish something that's a really hard thing to do and then I can try and be like well but now you should do this even harder thing or you should try and get this thing or that and the publishing is so much out of your control. Like you can't control most of it. So for someone who likes to up the ante on myself and control a lot of things, I'm learning that I need to let go and just let the book take its process that it's going to have. Um, and then the other thing too is I think I was surprised by how, while I'm super excited and have so many moments where I'm just smiling and excited and thrilled, I also feel super vulnerable. And I think that that's maybe something helpful to talk about for anybody who's going to be going down this path or is walking this path that a piece of my heart is now on paper yes. and people can dismiss it or they can write it off in two seconds or they can hate it. Yeah. Or, you know, or they can love it and it could be something good and beautiful in their life. And there's a vulnerability with that, something that you put your heart into being out there. And I wasn't ready for it, but I think like much like I'm a, I'm a parent, like I couldn't know what being a parent felt like until I had a kid. Mm -hmm. I couldn't really know or really prepare for what this felt like until I've started walking the path. And so I'm just trying to accept it for what it is, but sometimes it's hard because like, oh, I thought I'd just feel amazing. Like all I ever wanted was to see my book on a shelf, but it's such a personal thing. And I think it's okay that there's vulnerability there too. Yeah. You put so much of yourself into a book and like the characters even are probably representations of yourself. And then usually in real life, people don't go around judging you like to your face, <laughs> but people like have their job is to judge your book and to write reviews about <laughs> <laughs> and so you yeah there's this whole experience of being very overtly judged that you just don't get in the real world in the real world 
<laughs> yeah, my um, I had a college professor who was really amazing. Her name was Valerie Lakin at UW Milwaukee. And we've been emailing since this happened because honest to goodness, I was probably the least likely writer in that class to ever get a book deal when I started. She taught me so much and I learned I could learn how to be a writer through her classes. But she sent me this cartoon about someone giving bad feedback on a piece of art and something at the bottom of the cartoon was captioned and yet it survived you not liking it. Like it's, it's still there. It made it. And that's been really helpful for me to frame it and just be like, you know what, like it's going to find the people it's meant to find. And it's going to mean something to people that it's meant to mean something to, and that's okay. And that's great, but it will survive if it doesn't connect with somebody and it will survive if somebody doesn't even like it or somebody walks by it on a shelf and completely ignores that it's there, like it will survive. It's okay. And I've already seen that it's meant something to some people, which has been just beautiful. And that that's a really special part of that vulnerability is when you learn that your book meant something to somebody. Yeah. What's your favorite part of the process drafting or revising? Revising. I hate drafting. It's terrible for me. It was particularly jar like jarring to go from copy edits and proofreading on the circus of stolen dreams to rough drafting my second book because I was going from something so polished and that was very much the way I wanted to tell the story to first draft, <laughs> which was not the way I wanted to tell the story and just felt like, why can't I word right? Like, why can't I put these words in the right order that it does what I want them to do? And so that's been another thing I've learned is that I have to accept that that's part of the process and I can fix and I can revise a rough draft. I can't revise something I didn't try to write. So just being like, this is okay. This is part of it. But revising is fun because that's when it starts to turn into the story that I hoped it could be. And I can see the pieces falling into place and the pacing, you know, clicking in and all the stuff starting to work together. Yeah. What's been the most helpful revision tip that you've gotten along the way? Juliana and Lacey really worked with me on theme. And I think that everything I do will forever be tainted in the best of ways by what they taught me. I try very hard to, when I'm revising, make decisions in light of my theme, but also to tie the plot in as much as I can into theme. So um, the things that my character goes through in my book are tied into the emotional journey that she's on. So when I'm revising, if I have something that's maybe not working um, or just doesn't feel right. I have to think, okay, well, is this connected? Is this plot device or this plot element connected to the emotional journey of my character? And if it's not, do I need to change it or cut it? And thinking about things through that lens has just helped hopefully me craft a, a tightly plotted and emotionally compelling story. And that's really what I look at a lot when I'm revising is, am I doing that well? Or where am I not doing it well? And how can I change it? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so are you a perfectionist or a chaos artist? I lean towards control and perfectionism, <laughs> probably way more than I'm chaotic. I will have a multiple page outline. My editor sent me a nine page edit letter for my second book, which was a little bit shorter than my first book edit letter. Yeah. But I added over 10 pages of notes into her edit letter with my plan for how to attack the notes. Oh, wow. So. Yeah, I mean, that pretty much probably says it all. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, do you have a huge ego or are you humble and demure? I think, so I saw and thought about this question because I thought it was a really interesting and cool question. Mm -hmm. My whole worldview comes from the place where I think that every single human being is worthy of dignity and love and respect no matter what. So I try to frame all of my interactions with people in that way. And if I ever stepped away from that, I think I would, I would be pretty disappointed in myself. I really, really want to make sure that as much as I can, when I encounter someone in person, virtually through my stories, that they understand that I believe that every person is worthy of dignity and love and respect. So that would be best case scenario is that's how I treat every single person. <laughs> I, I love that worldview. Um, are you a morning writer or an evening writer? I am a whenever I can writer. I have four kids at home. We homeschool them. So I have had to let go of the notion of having this sacred 
protected writing time. That would be great if I get there someday, but I'm not there now. We do do a few things. I write often in the afternoons. Um, my kids have quiet time or the baby takes a nap or we have a babysitter come once in a while for a couple hours. So afternoons, sometimes after the kids go to bed or when my husband gets home from work, I'll sneak away for a bit or on the weekends. But I will tell you one thing that it is never, ever, ever in the morning. <laughs> Like early morning, like that 5 a.m. writer's club, so much respect, we'll never make it. To <laughs> um, are you a plotter or a pantser? Plotter. And are you a character first writer or a plot first writer? <sighs> I'm a, an emotional journey first writer. <laughs> I guess a theme first writer, maybe yeah. if that could be like a third category. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And so I always usually have kind of a sense of place and what I want the place to feel like. So for the Circus of Stolen Dreams, I had the feeling of the circus. And then I had, then I built in the emotional journey of the character. And then in my second book, I had the, the place of this in-between land between the living and the dead that's filled with ghosts on their way to ever after. And then I had the emotional journey of a girl who feels emotionally dead, who comes back to feel nice life and embracing life again. So yeah, I'm kind of like an adjacent area on that. Awesome. <laughs> um, would you ever like to be famous? I think I would be delighted if at the end of my life, I could look back and see that I had written a body of work that I was proud to leave in the world. And if some readers had found me, and my stories had meant something to them. I don't really have any desire for like a lot of people to like recognize me on the street or anything like that. That sounds incredibly stressful. I'm very much an introvert, but at the same time, do I, would I love it if a read like a reader once in a while, like recognize me and said they love my books? Yes. Yeah. But you know, like I think there's like a line, like maybe yeah. sure. I would love to be author famous, but we know that like author famous is a little bit yeah. safer maybe than rock star famous. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, if you could have um, one non-supernatural, so I stress to everyone, non-supernatural ability, what would it be? I think to let go of the things that I can't control really easily. To be like, oh, I can't control that. Well, great. That's fine. And to, like the anxiety side of things, like that's something that's hard. So if I could have an ability to let things roll off my shoulders and just move on and not overanalyze, that would help. I'm working on that, but it's taking a lot of hard work. So if I could just like snap my finger and have the ability to do that, I think that'd yeah. be great. Awesome and relatable. Are you a Virgo? <laughs> I'm a Virgo. Yes, I think I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes sense, huh? Uh, yeah, well, just like the being anxious about everything and um, wanting to make everything perfect and, you know, every, I relate to that a lot. <laughs> so good pick. I think a lot of people can. We don't always talk about it that much, but I feel like that's, it's common. It's, this is a, especially in the writing community, like we're doing something that's yeah uh, brave whenever we write words down and it can be scary and we can want to cling tight to anything we think we can cling on to, even if we can't. Yeah, definitely. And what are you working on right now? So I have turned in my first round of developmental edits to my editor. So I'll be waiting on if we're doing, um, I'm expecting another round of edits on that sometime this fall. And that is a creepy, magical retelling of The Secret Garden. Nice. Which I'm really excited about. She bought it on a very short pitch and it's just been so much fun to write and have her help me develop and grow the story. And then I also am working on pitches. We have an option clause in my contract. So I'm trying to think of a few different story ideas and write some sample chapters whenever I can. Um, just make sure I'm ready for when that time comes. Cool. Thank you so much for being on the channel. Uh, check out all the buy links below. Um, and check out Circus of Stolen Dreams. Thank you so much again.